Gosh, I mean, that's a question that a lot of very smart people spend a lot of time thinking about. In a way, you could say enlightenment is the answers given in the 18th century to the question, what is enlightenment? Uh, and those are very diverse answers. I mean, for me, the key thing is there's a kind of, um, first of all, I think, a sort of uh, forward-lookingness about the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment is is a period when intellectuals assume that progress can be made, and therefore all the answers are not in the past. Many earlier humanists sort of assumed that the past was wiser and uh, better informed in some ways than we were, that Plato was was smarter than Montaigne, as it were. But... Uh, but I think in, in, in the Enlightenment, people start to think, well, uh, science is growing. Uh, we are learning more. We know more than our ancestors. And there's a nice question which um, which William Hazlitt, the English uh, writer, asks uh, at, the, at the turn of the 19th century, which is, um, uh, why are the arts not progressive? Um, so there's a kind of assumption that we are making progress in politics, uh, liberal politics is growing, um, respect for rights, um, anti-slavery is growing, uh, which is obviously part of respect for rights and, and dignity. Respect for dignity is growing, um, and science is growing, uh, and the new sciences are growing. In um, at the turn of the 19th century, new sciences are developed. The word uh, biologie is, co is coined in 1800. Um, so all of these things involve a certain orientation towards the future. Uh, it, it, they involve the thought that the future would be better than the past. And as I say, you know, in the ancient world, the, the attitude was we're on the descent from Eden. We're, we're on the way down from the golden age. But in the, in the Enlightenment, we have this very forward-looking attitude, the idea that the future will be better. And of course, they were right. <laughs> I mean, terrible things happened in the future of the Enlightenment, but but on average, many many things did get better, uh, and and the rise of um, respect for human rights is a is I think a, a product of Enlightenment. Um, the the decline in cruelty. Seventeenth um, century Europe is full of cruelties. People are being hanged. In public, and their bodies are being cut up for the for the pleasure of crowds, and so on. Again, so huge amounts of things that we think of as as part of the achievements of the of the modern world uh, begin to be thought through and imagined. I think so. That's what I think of when I think of enlightenment. That period of enlightenment. I think the important uh, lesson of the concept of slavery is that it's one of those concepts that, yes, it sort of applies universally, but the details of how enslavement worked are enormously different in different places. And that changes the moral significance uh, of, of what was going on. Um, you know, uh, Horace... Uh, was the son of a freedman, of a freed slave. And yet he was one of the two greatest poets of Augustan Rome, and he went to dinner with Mycenaeus, with the richest, the richest of the Romans. Um, that kind of slavery is, di is different from plantation slavery in the New World uh, in, in the 18th and 19th centuries, when you couldn't imagine somebody being freed and then uh, allowed to become a great poet. Um, so in Ashanti, uh, in, in, in slavery in Ashanti, where I grew up, um, very important, uh, the Ashanti Empire, uh, 
which, of whose capital I grew up in, Kumasi, uh, grew rich on the slave trade starting in the 18th century and had within it uh, many kinds of people that you might have called slaves. Uh, there were so-called uh, debt pawns. There were people who were given from one family to another in return for a monetary loan, and their labor and their time belonged to that family until the loan was repaid. There were people captured in warfare who could be sold on into the Atlantic slave trade or sold on to other parts of Africa, um, and so on. There are different kinds of un unfreedom, and there are different statuses, um, despite the fact that these people were all unfree, um, uh, th they were entitled to get, to be married. Uh, and it, it, it was wrong to, um, it, it, it was wrong to interfere with their marriages and so on. So, um, so there are these different statuses, which you can enter. And, uh, but at the heart of, heart of them is a set of distinctions between people of different status so that some people are uh, entitled to a kind of respect and others are to expect disrespect or contempt or indifference or, or lack of respect. And that pattern, which is associated with these legal statuses, doesn't change when you just change the legal status. So as, I, as I've written, I knew people when I was growing up because slavery was officially abolished in Asante only in the 20th century. Um, I knew people who had been born into slave status, and some of them at least had a sense of themselves as, as not mattering. And that sense of yourself as not mattering, which was there in New World slavery as well, as it was there in the slavery in the Americas, is one of the great... Uh, wounds of slavery is that sense of your own unworthiness uh, what uh, what the great uh, american jamaican sociologist orlando patterson calls uh, natal alienation you're you're born without um the right to the, the to proper standing and respect so i think um and we we for me, that that's the great harm of slavery, <laughs> is that it takes people who are who have worth, who have dignity, and it tries to persuade them that they're worthless and that somebody else can manage their lives, tell them what to do, do what they like with them. Um, Thomas Jefferson was entitled to have children with the women who who were enslaved on his plantation if he wanted, and he did. Uh, he was entitled to beat people. He was entitled to sell them. He was entitled to sell their children. He was entitled to command them to do things for him. And and they may or may not, I mean, no doubt some of them rightly resented that, but too many of them would have been persuaded that this was just part of the normal order of things. And that's that's, I think, one of the great arms of slavery. And that idea that nobody should be treated that way, that everybody is entitled to freedom as a status, that is the status of not being an enslaved person. Uh, that's one of the great legacies of enlightenment, is, is the thought that uh, even women are entitled to uh, equal standing, even, even, uh, even foreigners, even slaves are entitled, uh, that nobody should be treated in that way, that now uh, we need a world in which a certain kind of fundamental standing is granted to everybody, and that fundamental standing is encapsulated in in a word that um, in, in dignity, uh, a word that of course Kant made central to his moral thinking. So, we, I think, you, you, you uh, I mean, Hegel's right that there's that there's something central uh, to uh, slavery in the fact that it requires a kind of recognition. It 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 gets a kind of recognition from the enslaved person uh, for the master, and the master requires that recognition from the enslaved person, and the enslaved person also gets a certain kind of recognition from the master. But um, but the details matter, and the details of that relationship are very different in different places, and there's only. 
but there is this one general thing we can say, which is that unless people see each other vis-a-vis, face-to-face, eye-to-eye as equals, there's something wrong uh, in their relations as human beings. The status of the slave in in the Americas, uh, and let's talk about the United States in particular, because it's 1619 is the date of the arrival of the first enslaved Africans in in what became uh, the United States. Um, that that uh, that the, in that 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 starts then, but what eventually gets established is something that did not exist in Africa, which is an identification of uh, slave status with a class of bodies, black bodies. Uh, The slaves in Africa are the same color as as the people who enslaved them. And so the color is irrelevant uh, to the status. You can't tell what status is by looking at them. But while in 1619 there wasn't yet uh, a racialized form of slavery, and there's barely, barely a, a racialized understanding of anything. Um, eventually, and certainly um, by, uh, by by the uh, by the 18th century, um, by the mid 18th century, there is an identification of enslavement with with particularly with Africans. Um, in North America, there's very little enslavement of native peoples. Um, and eventually, as I say, the, the status of slave becomes the status of the black, of the black body. Um, that's that. Doing that for centuries obviously shapes shapes the society. It shaped the constitution. The debates in the constitution about enslavement are central to the final settlement of what what the American Constitution looks like. Um, slaves are counted for the purposes of um, apportioning votes, uh, but only as two-thirds of a person. And of course, they aren't going to vote at all. Um, and and then over the next um, 60, 70 years, the vision in the country ends up producing the bloodiest civil war of the 19th century, at the heart of which is the question uh, whether the United States will continue to allow the legal enslavement of black people. And, and as you know, the, the war ends with, um, with legal emancipation. But just as in Ghana, that legal emancipation uh, of lo- lo- vast numbers of people doesn't mean that all of them suddenly now feel that they have equal status. And it doesn't mean that uh, a lot of the white people suddenly start to think of them as having equal status. And so status inequality persists and is eventually legally reinforced uh, after the end of uh, Reconstruction. And what we have is a system of uh, legal inequality for black people in, in many states um, throughout the period from legal emancipation until the 1960s, really. Um, the, the, the beginnings of the undoing of legal, constitutionally permitted white supremacy come in the 1950s, I suppose, with the, with the so-called Brown decision, uh, where the Supreme Court says you can't have legally enforced separate schooling for black and white children. And in a way, the last of the anti-white supremacy decisions occurs in the late 60s in a case about marriage, which is amusingly called loving, uh, since the the couple in question were Mr. and Mrs. Loving. 
uh, where the, the Supreme Court says you can't you can't enforce um, legal uh, bans to interracial marriage, and so this thing that begins in 1619 uh, continues to be of enormous constitutional significance uh, right up until the time that I was a teenager. And the legal end of these forms of white supremacy uh, do, do, do not, does not guarantee uh, the uh, social equality. And if you look at the, if you look at the data, the economic data, the the unemployment data, educational data, and so on in the United States, you can still see that there's that black and white people do not have the same, uh, do not have the same, uh, 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 do not face the same social reality, uh, the same economic reality, the same political reality. Um, so, it, uh, one cannot, I think, tell the story of the United States without. Uh, seeing that there is this one thematic strand throughout throughout our history of um, racial inequality, uh, especially for black people, but also uh, uh, for Asians, East Asians. Um, we have uh, legal acts to exclude Chinese immigration to the United States. We have uh, in the 19th century, of course, we have um, a lot of anti-Semitism and uh, a lot of anti-Catholic sentiment from uh, hostility to Irish and Italian immigrants as well. So there's a lot of, uh, there's a long history of intolerance, but the central theme of it is, is, is I think, intolerance uh, and oppression of black people. And, and often, in order to understand the oppression of the others, you have to understand their relation to black people. So it's the, there's a wonderful book called How the Irish Became White. Um, the, the end of that kind of uh, oppression of Irish people in this country comes when they're incorporated into the white body, having been thought of as racially distinct uh, from the Anglo-Saxon Protestant population. Uh, they they come to be seen as as white, and the same happens to the, to the Irish, I mean to the Italians, and 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 and, and similarly uh, this happens to Jewish Americans. They become uh, they become in having been thought of as racially quite alien uh, when they start arriving in in the nineteenth century in large numbers and into the twentieth century. Uh, they come to be seen eventually as as white people. Uh, that doesn't mean anti-Semitism doesn't persist it does but it's it has a different shape uh once it's um once the the complete racial othering of uh jewish americans stops Oddly, the first Kantian, first person who knew Kant uh, to to come to Ghana, to the Gold Coast, because it, it was only became Ghana in 1957, uh, was a man called Anton Wilhelm Amu, who was a uh, born in Ghana, but educated in uh, by the Dukes of uh, Wolfenbüttel, uh, and he was the godson of um, uh, he, he was the godson of Anton. Uh, uh, Anton von Wolfenbüttel, um, who was Leibniz's uh, Leibniz was his librarian, uh, and he he was educated in in law and philosophy in Germany, and ended up teaching uh, philosophy, and then retired to Ghana, uh, to, or to the Gold Coast, uh, in the mid eighteenth century. So we know there was at least one one person in the eighteenth century in Ghana who knew his Kant. Uh, because uh, because Anton Wilhelm Amu was was in Ghana, but of course he was a singular figure and he didn't have students and there was no there were no schools where he could teach, uh, and and nobody could read um, read German. 
so um the real um discovery of um european philosophy by significant numbers of uh, people in 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 the gold coast in west africa gold coast nigeria sierra leone and so on occurs uh, with the rise of modern, the modern university uh, in those countries. Now there are there, there are universities in the nineteenth century. I mean, there's the in 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 um, in, in Freetown in Liberia and in in Monrovia. I'm sorry, in Monrovia in Liberia and Freetown in Sierra Leone. There are the beginnings of colleges at that time. But the real takeoff in that kind of education basically occurs uh, after the Second World War uh, when we have in 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 Nigeria we have Ibadan which is a, a, a part of the university the British university system but it's in the British colony of Nigeria and we have Legon which is uh, the uh, an external college of the University of London but it's in uh, just outside Accra in Ghana and their philosophy is taught in the way that it was taught in London. It's the same curriculum, uh, the same exams. And uh, so there you have people educated um, like, uh, well, Kwesi Wiridu, the great Ghanaian philosopher, who, um, who who's, um, I would say, uh, a universalist i mean that is to say he thinks philosophy is a universal conversation but it's a universal conversation in which people are speaking to one another from different places and with different things to teach and to learn and so i mean one of his very interesting ideas uh is that is that um is to recognize the ways in which uh, our language, the language that we, are, our, our mother tongues, uh, shape the philosophy we can do. And so he and uh, another great Ghanaian philosopher, Kwame Jechi, uh, uh, they write about conceptions of the person. What, what, is a, what is a person? How does, what is the relationship between the soul, the mind, the body, uh, uh, in in the constitution of a person, uh, drawing on the conceptual resources of the Akan languages, which are spoken in Ghana and and Ivory Coast, uh, and especially of Tree, which is the language of um, spoken by I don't know forty fifty percent of Ghanaians uh, as a first or second language, um, and but but he's you know very much in dialogue with European philosophy. Um, Kwame Jechi is also a classicist, so he's in in dialogue with Aristotle and Plato and uh, and uh, and Socrates. And as I say, I think they think of they think of philosophy as a universal conversation, but a conversation in which what where you come from, what language you speak, um, will affect uh, what you see and what you have to say. And so. Um, they're not relativists uh, um, in the sense of thinking that uh, there are different truths for different people. Uh, they are relativists in recognizing that what you see depends on where you stand. So they're, they're what you might call standpoint relativists, but that strikes me as a, as a perfectly sensible form of relativism. It says, um, if you want to grasp reality you have to accept that you're in reality and that you have a relation to the things that you're experiencing that depends upon your your position where your position means not just where you are but your conceptual resources um and, and so on so i would say that's and that sense of um um that's and that that means that there is this small but but important group of uh, of philosophers, say in Ghana, who who are 
we're Ghanaian philosophers, they're drawing on Ghanaian intellectual traditions, but they're very much in conversation with European philosophy, especially uh, European philosophy uh, starting in the in the in the eighteenth century. And um, the, the, you know there are other we, we could mention other figures. Kwame Nkrumah, the first president of Ghana, uh, wrote philosophical works, uh, published philosophical works. They were probably drafted by a man called Willie Abraham, who was a another Ghanaian philosopher, another Akan philosopher who 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 went to Oxford and and was a fellow of All Souls College and then and then taught in the United States. But he, um, he so. And that work is very influenced by by another thing that we can think of as a kind of post enlightenment tradition. And it's very influenced by by his readings, his reading of Marx, uh, and of um, um, of socialist tradition. So, and I would say that an awful lot of um, the intellectuals, and in, including the politically active intellectuals who became presidents, like in Krumah in Ghana, or Nereri in Tanzania, or Kenyatta in Kenya, uh, those people were um, very influenced by by socialism, um, not by uh, not by Marxism in the sense of um, state ownership of the means of production, uh, but by the idea. I think what they took from socialism was was among other things the thought that I said I thought of as the as the great enlightenment thought, which is that um, which is that equality is a central uh, political value that uh, and that it's a moral value, and that we should treat one another as equals not just uh, not just in politics, uh, but in in life. People reading some of the African philosophers that I mentioned uh, will notice that there is a strong sense in their political and ethical writings of the importance of family and community. And so they will contrast a kind of communitarian ethos in, in African philosophy with a more individualist ethos in, in, in European philosophy. I think that contrast is wildly overdrawn. Um, uh, families matter. Um, I, <laughs> I have an English mother. I know that families matter in England. Uh, my grandmother looked after me when I was a child. Uh, my aunts and uncles looked after me. I spent Christmas with them. Um, and, and I love my cousins. So, um, and of course, my sisters and my, my nephews and nieces and my great nephews and nieces. So, uh, and and we're, we're only half Ghanaian. So, um, so I think the importance of family in um ethics and politics is something that was that was oddly neglected in so-called liberal political theory um the the liberal political theory which which of course predates it's the tradition predates the enlightenment because it goes back to people like locke um but it but locke Locke's politics, uh, I mean, the, all these people, Locke and and um, uh, uh, you know Hume and so on, they all mention the fact that people have families, but but they take the fundamental unit of society to be a, a sort of a, a, a person, and and if you read what he's like, he seems awfully like a male person, and his his existence, his production. The fact that he needed he needed a mother and a father, and an upbringing, is somewhat uh, neglected. Now I don't, you know, of course Locke wrote essays on education, and 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 he recognized that human beings did not come into the world prepared for social life, uh, because he thought of our brains as as uh, as a tabula rasa. But 
um, but there's not enough focus on the way in which, on, on the sense in which it really is true that the fundamental unit of society is is not really the individual. It's it's the family. It's it's only with families that you can make societies, um, because people don't come into the world ready for for human life, or, and they don't come into into the world ready for social life. So, but it is true that um, the the contrast between the the supposed contrast between individuality and community community, as posited as a contrast between Europe and Africa. Um, uh, is I, I, too sharply drawn, but there is a a tradition of uh, but but the individual comes to be more central and freer from family in the course of the social and economic developments that begin in the Enlightenment, though to some extent they begin with the freedom with the with. Uh, when when uh, peasants are freed from the land in the late feudal period, and so instead of your labor belonging to the person on whose land you live, uh, you can go into a labor market. And this, this happens obviously long before the 18th century in some places, uh, though it doesn't happen until the 19th century in, in Russia. Um, but still, there, there is an increasing um, freeing of the individual from the bonds of the family, because as capitalism develops, uh, people become workers and workers sell their labor individually. They don't bring their families with them to the factory. Uh, men and women come to the factory as individuals, they're paid as individuals, and, and they can move from one uh, place to another in search of, of jobs. And when you're moving, of course, you take your children with you, but you don't take your parents with you, and you don't take your cousins with you. And so that sense of embeddedness in the family that you get in the life of a village, where you grow up surrounded by people whom you will know your whole life, many of whom are your relatives, uh, from among whom you will pick your, your spouse, and so on, that with with increasing mobility um, and with increasing labor mobility in particular, that that disappears. So I grew up on a I grew up in in the second largest city in Ghana, but I grew up on a street with my grandfather and my step grandmother across the street, and with my godparents down the street, and with uh, cousins all over the place, and um, so so the family that sort of sense of embeddedness in a complex network of people to whom you're connected through kinship as well as other things. Um, you know, that depends upon living a certain kind of life and the, and the modern economy doesn't like that kind of life because it wants me to be willing to move from that place where I grew up to New York where I now work uh, and be, and, and they don't want to bring me, they don't want me to bring my parents with me and my, my cousins. They want me to come by myself because they can only afford me, <laughs> they can't afford to support the whole lot. Uh, so, so I think that there's a there's a set of economic changes which happen all around the world, which make, uh, which sort of individualize people, that make them more and more increasingly um, having to depend upon themselves and and, and a narrow uh, family, a family of a, a spouse and children. And then the children are going to go away and become independent. Not they're, no, they're not going to be dependent for their whole life. And the parents uh, are not going to assume that in old age, their care will be in the hands of their children. Uh, it will be in the hands of uh, professional caregivers. And that will be a market relation as opposed to a family relation that looks after them and so on. Now, that transition has not occurred in Africa in many places. And so, you know, when my mother got old, she didn't go anywhere. She stayed home. That the same people looked after her as she had um, looked after when she was <laughs> uh, fitter and, uh, and she died in her own house. Um, but, 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 and many, many people in many parts of Africa are a bit shocked when you describe to them 
uh, a world in which grandparents retire thousands of miles away from from their children and grandchildren and see them only once or once a year or twice a year or something they think that's very shocking but it's normal and now in some places and it'll probably become increasingly normal everywhere so anyway th there's a lot of social change going on that accounts for a shift in focus from thinking of us as embedded in a community that is the same community throughout our lives to thinking of us as yes always embedded in community but free to move between one community and another uh, following jobs uh, maybe following partners and so on now so that's what makes the category of the individual so crucial because we have to organize an ethical and a political and a social life in which people who are in that way somewhat freed from the the, the deeper networks of kin uh, can flourish and so and that means that um whereas even when i was a child which uh, is not so long ago uh where i grew up uh, my parents would have been involved in picking my spouse for me um well in this new world that's not going to happen uh for one thing my parents uh, won't know the, uh, the, the in the world in which families make marriages as opposed to individuals make marriages in that world the the parents know the parents of the other party and so they have some relevant expertise they have some knowledge that's relevant to deciding whether whether this is a suitable person for you to marry um if i meet someone in college in a town that my parents have never been to how are they supposed to decide whether this person is a suitable partner for me they don't know the family they don't know anything about them um so so the central um relationship of a human life now once you're an adult is your relationship with a partner if you have one and that relationship is is not any longer a matter of links between two families it's a matter of links between two people and the families they come to the wedding they're interested in the children and so on but the children are your children they're not your grandparents they're not their grandparents grandchildren their relationship to their grandparents is set by the parents and so on so anyway all of these social changes mean that um we need a a political life uh, in particular that allows people to manage their own lives and that's really what john stuart mill meant by individuality he meant that each of us is in is ultimately in charge of our own lives and yes we have social responsibilities and we have family responsibilities but ultimately my life is mine and i have to make it with the advice and um perhaps sometimes the help of other people but still i'm i'm the boss of my of my life and that's i think the central thought of of million individuality and that goes back to something that um is actually there's only one philosopher that mill quotes in um in on liberty and that's uh and that's uh humboldt and he quotes humboldt because humboldt already in the late enlightenment in the 18th century though it wasn't published until the 19th century uh wrote a book about the limits of the authority of the state over the individual and on liberty in a way is just a kind of series of footnotes to humboldt's um uh, essay uh, on the limits of state on state action and uh and i think that what what humboldt was thinking and humboldt was of course among other things the prussian minister of education um he was thinking that we need to prepare people for a life in which they are in charge of their own lives that's what education is that's what building is building is preparation for life as a free person and a free person is a person in charge of their own life 
It doesn't mean you don't care about other people. It doesn't mean you don't have moral obligations to other people. It doesn't mean you don't have political obligations. But you're the person managing all that. And that's my, I think that idea of individuality, which as I say, I think Mill gets from Humboldt. Uh, and, and, you know, Humboldt again is shaped by, by enlightenment, but also by romanticism. Because, because again, this idea of, that I can discover who I am and manage my own life, that's, a, that's, that's an idea, that, that's a poet's idea. <laughs> that, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a, a romantic idea. Uh, all of these things, which come from the 18th century, got, come together in this idea of mills of individuality, and and it's um, that idea. Uh, I think is a powerful, important idea, and it's one that resonates increasingly uh, in many places. Uh, many young Africans are asking the question: um, How much can my family ask of me? this is my life um my family gave me much it gave me life it, it raised me it shaped me but then it but then it has to let me go i have to be i have in the end to be the boss of my own life i think and that 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 idea that you would that you can't that your family isn't entitled just to summon you back when you're needed is one that I think would resonate with many young people. I remember my first job was at the University of Ghana, and I had uh, I was the lowest paid person on campus, so I only had two servants, <laughs> and and they came from another part of the country. And when I was leaving, it was a period of intense economic stress, and there was lots of inflation and so on. And I I didn't know how they were going to be employed, so I suggested to them that they should go back to the village that they came from because at least there there was someone an uncle or a, or a father or a grandfather who would who would who would take care of them would be responsible and they looked at me as if i was crazy because they had left that world precisely because they didn't want a father or an uncle or a grandfather to tell them what to do they wanted to manage their own lives and they were willing to live on the edge of starvation poverty at the edge of a, of a great modern city which is not a very friendly place uh, rather than go back and be entrapped, as they would have seen it, uh, in the world of a, of a family. So I'm, I'm, that conversation stuck, has stuck with me my whole life because I realized that they, that um, I, I didn't think of my family in that way. I didn't think of them as uh, being potentially entrapping me. Uh, I thought of my family as uh, as uh, having created me in order to set me let me go uh, and and I, you know i think that's obviously increasingly the case uh, everywhere so so that that transition you see this now in modern china we have many chinese students uh, at, at my university um you know their their families are have created them not in order to come back and look after them in old age but that they've created them in order to set them free so I think this idea is taking off in lots of places. And, and in the circumstances of modern life, I think it's a beautiful idea. Obviously, if we were all still living in villages where we were economically tied to each other for the whole of our lives, this would make much less sense. So I'm not saying that the old idea was crazy against its background. But against our background, I think this idea of individuality is the right one. Right. But in a way, the reason they're fleeing is because they want to be in charge of their own lives. And they don't think they will be in charge of their own lives if they stay where they came from. The, the, in other words, they're fleeing to individuality. They're fleeing to kind of freedom. There's a reason why the chapter on individuality is one of the elements of well-being is chapter three of a book called On Liberty. <laughs> uh, there's a deep connection that kind of modern freedom is 
the freedom that many people are seeking. Now, look, many um, refugees are escaping poverty. Uh, not then it's not the, 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 the political unfreedom may be there and the poverty may be the result of political unfreedom but but what they really want is just food and they want to be able to feed their children and they want to be able to make sure that their children grow up and have have um get educated and have have a chance but uh so so that's important too and there's a deep connection between a concern for uh, economic security and this kind of individuality because you can't manage your own life. You can't make plans. You can't think about who you want to be and how you want to live if you don't have enough to eat and if you don't have a shelter over your head and if you're worried that your children are going to die because you can't get them health care. Uh, you 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 don't. That's a kind of unfreedom too. Uh, it's 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 the unfreedom of not being able to stand back and think and plan because you're too busy surviving. And so, if we care about this kind of individuality, we have to make a world in which nobody faces that situation wherever they live. That everybody everywhere has the basic material security that means you can think about who you want to be, what life you want to live, who you want to make it with, and so on. And so, yes, uh, the, the the world of uh, f f uh, refugees uh, contains people fleeing both that kind of economic insecurity and people who are just f fleeing political oppression. And the political oppression is offensive because they can't, in the world of of oppression, they can't, they can't manage their own lives. The state is telling them what they can and can't do, who they can be. Um, the Chinese state is telling people now, increasingly, uh, you can't, uh, you can't make uh, gay couples. It's 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 increasingly homophobic. Uh, the uh, the Indian state is telling people you can't live as a free Muslim, uh, and so on. The world is full of uh, governments that are oppressively stopping people from making these choices for themselves. I don't care whether you're a Muslim. Uh, you should be in charge of whether you're a Muslim. That's That's what religious liberty is. And the government shouldn't be telling you whether you should be a Muslim or not, or a Hindu. Uh, or an atheist. It should be leaving that decision to you. So I think, I mean, a lot of the modern uh, political freedoms are just freedoms to manage your own life. Uh, freedom of conscience. Uh, um, and then, of course, there's freedom from things, freedom from torture, uh, freedom from uh, want, where that means the kind of want that means you can't even think about what to do next because you're too worried about whether you can eat. This is the thing that happens, that a word that has a perfectly good positive use get stigmatized for some reason and then it gets used to refer to something other than the very good thing that it was originally coined to cover now liberalism is a complex tradition the first party to call themselves liberals were i think spanish politicians in the early 19th century but uh i think of liberalism as having two important strands one definitely goes back to enlightenment and it's the strand which makes Kant a liberal it's the strand that says that individuals have rights have worth have dignity in virtue of their capacity to manage their own lives rationally now i think Kant overstates 
the importance of reason in all of this. I think there are other important human capacities that ground our rights. But still, the capacity to think through and decide for yourself, which you might call reason, is one of them. So that part of liberalism generates the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, the American Bill of Rights, and so on. It generates the idea that people, uh, there are things you can't do to people um, uh, without their consent, and that there are things you owe to people. And that thought is there, obviously, in the American Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men, were, and of course women too, were created equal, that they were endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, and that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So that's one part of liberalism, and that very similar language is there, of course, in the in the in the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, um, in part because it was produced by people in conversation with one another. Um, but there's a there's a second strand of modern liberalism which I think is very crucial and which doesn't and isn't really there even in, in Mill yet. And it comes from the thought that we were just talking about, the thought that you need a certain set of material circumstances in order to be able to develop the kind of human life that those liberties will enable. You cannot do that if you do not have food and shelter and health care. And so a second important strand of liberalism, which gets institutionalized in the 20th century uh, in the 1930s in the United States and increasingly in things like the welfare state that, that was created by the Labour Party in Britain after the Second World War, and then increasingly in the rest of Europe, um, is um, the second thing then is, is social, social and economic rights, uh, guarantees uh, of a certain basic level of, 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 of welfare. Uh, those are the things that John Rawls put together as a package in his theory of justice. Those are the two strands of the theory of justice, the rights and the uh, and and then distributive uh, stuff. Now, I think that that's a, that shows that liberalism is a kind of developing tradition that people are um, learning increasingly what it is to treat each other as equals. They're learning increasingly what it is to be free, to live as free people, which liberties matter. Um, in in the present time, it may be that one of the fundamental needs of a human being is access to the internet because that's where politics and and ideas happen and and people can only manage their own lives if they have access to the politics and ideas that they need in order to think about their lives so we we, we deepen our understanding of uh, of what we need in order to live these lives worth living but um so i think of that as as what's core to liberalism now uh, what are the enemies of liberalism uh, people of the word liberalism, what are they against? Uh, <laughs> sorry. So, so what are the enemies of liberalism against? Well, some of them are against something called neoliberalism. And I think that that is just uh, the thought, the, the mistaken thought in my view, that... Um, uh, that everything can be decided by the market. And that was that's not a liberal, that's just not part of the liberal package because the the whole point about the social and economic rights is the market isn't giving people uh, the basic, isn't guaranteeing people the basic uh, welfare conditions that they need. And so we, we the state has to do it instead. Society has to do it instead. So I don't know how that got to be thought to be a liberal idea. It strikes me as... Um, hostile to the second large strand of liberalism that developed in the 20th century. It's just it's just a mistake. Now you could say, well, all they're saying is we should go back to the liberalism of the 19th century, to the so-called night watchman state, where all all the state does is protect your rights uh, uh, against other against others. Um, well, um, I don't think that. Uh, I don't think that that's what Mill thought. Um, it's an important fact that that chapter of On Liberty that I keep mentioning uh, 
is called on individuality as one of the elements of well-being. He's not saying that these political freedoms and so on are the only thing that matter. He's just saying they matter a lot. But lots of other things matter. He was a utilitarian as well. He thought that welfare mattered. And so, so, so one kind of enemy of liberalism uh, is, is, um, is, is the neoliberal, I think. Uh, but then there are conservatives who I think are hostile precisely uh, to that sense that everybody should be uh, in, in charge of managing their own lives because conservatives um, think that tend to have a narrower set of conceptions about how it's how one should live and they want to be able to use the state to enforce those conceptions they want to be able to penalize people who um, have children outside of marriage uh, or who don't get married at all or who marry or who want to marry people who are not of the other gender um, they want to be able to impose religion on society and they want to be able to uh, privilege people of one faith uh, over people of other faiths and so on. They want to be able to use the state to settle questions for people that liberalism says should be settled by people for themselves. And uh, so I'm, I'm against the neoliberals and I'm against the conservatives, I think. And what's left is, I think, a perfectly valuable set of ideas, liberal ideas. Now, look, Liberalism um, has faces challenges which it needs to address when it comes to face the rise of what's called identity politics. Um, classical liberalism uh, began with a first wave feminism, so uh, Mill is also the author of On the Subjection of Women. He's not just the author of On Liberty. Uh, and Harriet Taylor, his wife, wrote important and even more radical feminist work. Um, and they're they're liberals. I mean, they're they're what what they're concerned about is that women are not free, and they don't have the rights that they're entitled to. Those are just liberal preoccupations. Um, but but. Uh, especially when it comes to 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 the to the new uh, to, to to the new identity political agenda, so feminism, um, anti racist movements, um, uh, LGBT movements, movements for gay and lesbian rights and for trans rights and so on. Uh, there, I think liberalism has all the resources it needs, the conceptual resources to say what's right and wrong in these movements and to endorse what's good about them, but it, but it needs developing. And that, you know, that's why I wrote a book called The Ethics of Identity, because I was interested in how liberals should think about identity. I don't think liberals are the enemies of identity, though they are going to be the enemies of certain kinds of identitarian movements. Look, liberalism develops um, alongside uh, your European nationalism and then anti-colonial nationalism. Nationalism is identity politics. And nationalism is taking one identity and our identity is, as a, as a, as a, as a nat national, as a member of a, of a people, and uh, seeing it as central to how we should think about our, our ethical and political lives. Um, I'm perfectly happy with that. I, my father... My father's autobiography was called The Autobiography of an African Patriot, and he was a very patriotic Ghanaian, and I don't I'm, I admire him for that. And I'm a pretty patriotic American. I'm 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 angry when America does the many terrible things it does, but that's only because I care about America. If I didn't care about America, I wouldn't I wouldn't be angry about those things. So so I don't have any objection to identity, uh, including national identity. I don't have any and I think liberals can be patriotic. In fact, I think liberals should be patriotic because they should be trying to make states in which the liberal values can be embodied and lived. Um, and you won't do that unless you care about your country. Uh, so, so I don't have any problem with identity. I can see that some there are, there's a kind of person who thinks of themselves as a classical liberal who thinks that 
we should relate to one, one another purely as citizens, that all this other stuff is irrelevant. But that just um, ignores the fact that it, these things matter to people. And if people are going to be allowed to manage their own lives, then what matters to them will affect what happens. And so you can't ignore identity if people care about their identities and if they bring them to bear in their political life. You can't tell people, forget that you're a man or a woman, forget that you're a Catholic or a Protestant or a Jew, forget that you're a gay or straight or trans or cis, uh, just come to the state as a bare citizen. What does that mean? It's meaningless. Uh, my my concerns are the concerns of a of a brown, male, gay, cis philosopher, and and I can't I can't forget about all those things. Of course, they don't matter in lots of contexts. When I'm thinking about healthcare in the United States, none of that matters. What matters is that everybody gets access to the healthcare they need, and I don't care. Uh, and I don't. You know, I don't want that as a man or as a black man or as a gay man. I want it as a, I just want it because I might get sick because I'm a vulnerable human being. And I want it for everybody else because I care about my fellow citizens. But, uh, but, but, so of course there are contexts in which it doesn't matter. Uh, but the idea that it doesn't, that we should be able to drop it altogether and that, and that the state should see us as a kind of blank slate, I think is, um, is inconsistent with this central thought that that each of us is in charge of our own lives and that therefore that what matters to us matters. Cosmopolitanism, like liberalism, is a long tradition. It's longer than liberalism. I mean, Diogenes said he was a cosmopolitas, and that was in the 5th century BCE. Um, but it's the, the, the tradition <laughs> is essentially a tradition of reflection on a metaphor. And the metaphor is, we are citizens of a particular polis, I'm a politeus of Athens, or in the case of Diogenes, I'm a, polit a politeus of uh, Sinope, a Sinope. Um, but, and, and that makes sense, that's literally true. And so that has a meaning. How can I make it metaphorically true that I'm also a politeus of the world? To begin with, this seems ridiculous, because after all, it's like the idea of the global village. The village is exactly the opposite of the, of the global. So how can there be a global village? Uh, the local is exactly the opposite of the, of the global. So how can, it, how can I transfer ideas about the local to the, to the global? Uh, but over time, the more you think about it, the clearer it becomes that there really is a thought here. And the thought is... is easiest to see if we remember that we are already um, citizens of both Berlin and Germany, or New York and the United States, that we have local and particular civic relations. Uh, when you vote for the mayor of Berlin and I vote for the mayor of New York City, we're not thinking about Germany, we're just thinking about Berlin uh, or, or New York. Uh, and and properly so, nothing wrong with that. Um, and that if that's possible, and it is, and it makes sense, and people do it all the time, why shouldn't it be possible to add in a sense of responsibility at at another level of generality, namely the, the, the both at uh, the level of Europe, sure, but then at the level of the world. And that's uh, that's the thought that makes it clear why the initial sense of paradox doesn't really need to be there. Of course, different things will matter to me as a Weltburger from the ones that matter to me as a New Yorker. But uh, 
but there are things that are going to matter to me as a citizen of the world. And, and there are problems that we humans face that we can't solve except as citizens of the world. We're not going to solve the climate crisis. Uh, New York isn't going to solve the climate crisis by itself. Uh, and and nor, is, nor are New York and Beijing and Berlin acting separately and independently going to solve. We need a global approach. We need a global approach to set fair rules of trade uh, to and to manage the seas, uh, the, the, the collective assets of humanity that don't belong even as a matter of law to any particular state, the atmosphere, the oceans. Um, and we need to work together as the COVID taught us because uh, bacteria and viruses don't care about borders. They move as they move. And if we don't respond to them collectively, we can't solve them. We, we will just be, uh, we'll be spinning uh, as, as, as these crises face us. So, um, so I think that's one part of the thing, of the tradition. It's just recognizing that it makes perfect sense to think of the global as a space of politics as a space where we have to work together to do things, just as we have to work together in New York to do things or in or in the United States to do things. Um, but from especially, I think, starting in the Enlightenment, there's another strand of the cosmopolitan thought, which is the what you might call the cultural cosmopolitanism, which is this sense which you see you see, this is in Goethe, who after all spoke about world literature, um, um, or in Herder. Um, you, you see this thought that our cultural lives are only to be enriched if we pay attention to the creativity of people in other societies. So... Goethe uh, writes the Vesteshiha Divan because he's thinking about Hafiz, who's a Persian poet. And, um, and Basho in 17th uh, century Japan writes Buddhist poems. Well, the Buddha was an Indian, a North Indian. Uh, so, um, and they... And Goethe wouldn't be Goethe without Hafiz, and Basho wouldn't be Basho without the Buddha, and Shakespeare wouldn't be Shakespeare without uh, uh, without having read uh, an obscure Danish chronicle about a prince called Hamlet. Um, so, so I think that sense that we that that the highest side of human creativity is na naturally uh, rooted, but uh, but also naturally curious about what's on the other side of the borders um, is is a central modern cosmopolitan thought. and um, and it's a, it's there especially as you mentioned in the modern sciences. The modern sciences are profoundly and expensively supported by many societies, but they're fundamentally transnational. Scientists go to labs in other countries, they email each other all the time, um, and this is not new. Um, Leibniz and Newton discovered the calculus together by writing letters across 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 Europe. Uh, the, the, the modern probability theory is the result of conversations between people in 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 Holland and France and Germany and England and Scotland. And um, so and, and you know just think of Gregor Mendel is is writing in in Bruno, but um, the first Nobel Prize for genetics goes to an American. Uh, in the in the early twentieth century, so, um, and and it, 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 it's not contingent that modern science is successful. Uh, 
and cosmopolitan. It's cosm it's successful because it's cosmopolitan. Uh, when when science closes itself off, as it did to a certain extent under Stalin, for example, uh, Soviet science went off off the rails. Lysenkoist biology is nonsense. Um, so I think it's um, it's not just in the humanities. It's in all of the highest forms of human creativity, philosophy and uh, science, as well as literature and the arts, that we see this. Think, you know, Handel, Handel's most famous music is written for an English king. Of course, the English king he wrote it for was a German, but but he wrote it in England. Um, and 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 ideas about music circulate. If, if you listen, it's perfectly clear that there's lots of North African influence in Spanish music, for example, unsurprisingly, given the history of that peninsula. And and there's arguments to the effect that ideas from uh, Amerindian music entered into um, into European music uh, after the the conquest of the Americas. Um, and and that there are, you know, Amazonian musical ideas or Andean musical ideas in in Monteverdi. So I think that it's really uh, that side of cosmopolitanism is um, uh, is part of the story about what's what our species has done that's most wonderful and most interesting, and that set of attitudes. Uh, the, my curiosity about Basho, who was one of my mother's favorite poets, uh, is part of the background that makes it possible for us to do the cosmopolitan politics. Because it's only because I already care about Japan, as it were, uh, through this poet, or I already care about Russia through Tolstoy, uh, or I already care about France uh, through you know, a score of novelists and, and poets, uh, that I'm primed to think of these as my fellow humans and primed to think that I can learn from them and that we can do things together. I think the the key thing about multiculturalism is that it really wasn't ever about culture. Uh, it was about identity. So-called multiculturalism of the sort that you have in um, the Ministry for Multiculturalism in Canada um, is really about how to manage a society of diverse identities. Uh, and it, it what's cultural about it is that it uses... Uh, education and um, culture in the sense of uh, of um, literature and the arts to try to create a, a background uh, against which people of multiple identities can flourish and live side by side and share a modern society. Um, I don't, I mean, I grew up in Ghana in, in a particular place speaking uh, one Ghanaian language, uh, well, two Ghanaian languages, because English is a Ghanaian language, but the, another Ghanaian language, tree. Um, so here I am, I'm, in, I'm living in New York City. Uh, I brought that language with me. I can use that language in New York City because lots of other people have brought that language with them. Lots of taxi drivers are amused when I greet them because uh, I can read their names and I can see that they come from from uh, uh, an Akan speaking part of Ghana from their names. Um, but this is s small stuff. It, it doesn't, th does it make New York a wonderful place that there are a few tens of thousands of people speaking this African language there? I don't know. I mean, it's a fact. Uh, hundreds of languages are in fact spoken by the children in New York City schools, uh, besides English. Uh, and and that co creates complications for managing those that school system, but is it um, we, we you know we don't need to get sentimental about this. Uh, 
uh, the most of those people who use my father's language in this city of New York uh, use it very use it infrequently and not very well. Um, I know what my father's language sounds like spoken by a beautiful speaker because my father was a beautiful speaker of the language and and we knew other people. I used to go and listen to the old queen mother of Asante who spoke the most beautiful ancient tree and didn't understand anything. If you said, if you introduced even one English word into the conversation, she would look at you in great puzzlement. Um, so I know what the language looks like when it's beautiful or it sounds like when it's beautiful. And it doesn't sound like that mostly because most of the people who use it in New York City, uh, about you know one in five of the words they use are English words and so on. So we don't want to get sentimental about this, but uh, uh, but we do live in a city with many languages and, and people, and people are attached to many, many different religious traditions in, in New York City as they are in Berlin. Uh, and, and if that creates problems, we have to solve them. Now, I don't think it needs to create problems, but sometimes it will. I mean, sometimes my religious attachments mean that I want to do something that you don't want to happen in, in your city, right? I mean, maybe you think that, it, that the way in which uh, animals are slaughtered for the purposes of um, uh, having kosher meat or having um, halal meat uh, is cruel to, to, to animals. Um, and so you want to pass a regulation that says that, that, that animals can't be killed that way in your city. And that will mean that Jews and Muslims in your city can't eat meat, right? I mean, while, main, my, while being religiously observant. So I don't mean it can't create problems. Now, in that particular case, it isn't really a problem because it turns out if you investigate the matter that the ways in which animals are killed for, for kosher and halal purposes, which are the same ways because they, they're the same tradition, um, turn out not to be any more cruel than the ways in which they're normally killed uh, for, other, for other purposes. So you don't have to stop them. Uh, you just have to investigate it and see. But it could have turned out that that was true. And then you have a choice to make. You have a choice to make about whether you care enough about your citizens, your, your fellow citizens' religious lives, uh, aspects of their religious lives that you don't care about at all, because I don't care about uh, kashrut, I don't care about Jewish religious uh, law. Um, whether, whether you want to create a, a community where they can do that at the cost of giving up something that you care about, which is um, animal rights. That's an example of a real problem. I mean, as I say, it isn't a real problem in fact, but I mean, it's the kind of thing that could be a real problem. Uh, Sikhs want to wear helmets. Sikh men want to wear, hel want to wear turbans so they can't wear motor bicycle helmets. Should we exempt them from from the law that says you can't ride a motor bicycle if you don't have a motor bicycle helmet. Again, there's good reasons for that law. The law is not anti-seek. It's not a, not a, it's not an expression of a prejudice, but it will, it will affect your Sikh fellow citizens in a way that it won't affect other people, and so on. So, so in those circumstances, I think a general attitude of uh, a, a liberal attitude that says people should be allowed to manage their own lives is helpful, but only up to a point. And then you just have to do politics. You have to talk to one another and see if you can figure out something that seems like a reasonable compromise to everybody. And it will only seem like a reasonable compromise if everybody feels they've given a little. Um, that's what I think life in a multicultural society, you know, should be like at its best. But it's, um, but that's not about culture in any interesting sense, right? That's a dis that's a moral disagreement. Um, it's not it's not a disagreement about whether sonnets are better than haiku or about whether sonata form is uh, is a good thing it's not a, it's not about culture in that sense 
Uh, and to the extent that it's about culture in the sense of habits of everyday life, practices of everyday life, that is a place where I think liberal toleration is in order. Um, when it's about serious moral disagreements, as it sometimes is because religion can be about serious moral matters and religion matters to people, um, then I think, you know, that you can't, there's no algorithm, there's no, except that all there is is the hope that we will treat each other with goodwill and that we will recognize that some things that don't matter to me at all matter a lot to other people and that they are my fellow citizens and so because it matters to them it matters to me not directly but indirectly and i think we should raise our kids with that attitude whatever we are whether we're muslims or jews or christians or anything else uh atheists we, we should raise our children with that attitude and and live in this and try to live in a society where we practice that but it, it, as i say it doesn't guarantee that you won't have difficulties that attitude and it doesn't mean that you won't end up having to make choices where you just do something that doesn't suit everybody The point about philosophical understanding is that you learn over the course of a life in philosophy that communicating concepts is often best done through stories. That talking abstractly about freedom or equality is different from talking about an experience of meeting someone who doesn't value herself because she was enslaved. And that gives you a deeper understanding, I think, of what's what's wrong with slavery, what's good about freedom, uh, than any amount of abstract characterization of, of, of something. So a lot of the point of the stories in my writing is that. It's to say, I've got a conceptual idea. I understand it best through stories, so I suspect that my readers will, so let me tell the stories. And I tell the stories from my own life uh, because those are to hand uh, <laughs> very often, uh, just because that is the first thing that thinks to me. I think, oh, that happened to me. Um, now I have had a much more interesting life than some people, I think, I, because I was, uh, I grew up, uh, as a child of two families, thousands of miles apart. And so I got to spend time, unlike most people, intimately engaged with two different societies. And, uh, also I came from very privileged background. And so I've had very interesting experiences. I, by the time I was eight, I had met uh, two monarchs, uh, the Queen of England and the King of Ashanti, shaking hands with both of them. Um, and my my father was in the Ghanaian Parliament. My grandfather was in the British Parliament. My great grandfather was in the British Parliament. His great grandfather was in the British Parliament. Uh, so I I had all these experiences that come from privilege and from the privilege of multi multi background uh, life and so often the stories that i tell can be interesting to people because they're experiences that uh, lots of people haven't had but i also tell stories from fiction i take stories from fiction i have a long discussion of uh, of, of a character in in uh, ishiguro's novel the remains of the day in one of my books um, and also I tell stories about other people's lives. I'm, I'm long discussion of the life of Italo Svevo in, um, in, in one of my most recent book. So I think that we learn concepts through narrative, uh, and that 
telling stories is very important. That means, of course, that we can learn concepts through narratives in literary contexts, not just in philosophical contexts. I think The Remains of the Day is a novel from which one can learn a very great deal about many ethical questions, even though it's not written by an ethicist. And even though he didn't mean to be teaching us about ethics, he just meant to be writing a great novel, I'm sure. Um, and he succeeded. So um, I'm, I, I think of uh, literature as one of the places where I learn these things. I think of history as a place where I learn things. I think of anthropology as a place. I've read a lot of anthropology in my life, and I've learned a lot about human life from thinking about it. Uh, um, and and I think that um, there are many ways of doing philosophy, but but one way of doing philosophy is that way. It's a humanistic way. It's paying attention to what you learn by by paying by reading history, uh, literature, uh, uh, including poetry, and so on. And um, so I, I now, um, uh, how did I learn this? Partly because I wrote non non narrative philosophy uh, for a while, and it's not as rewarding for my readers, I don't think. Um, partly because I grew up uh, in a very um, bookish family and and read a lot of essays as well as fiction when I was growing up. And so I, and I'm a big fan of uh, Michel de Montaigne, uh, who I think is a good example of a philosopher who, who can, communicates ideas by telling stories, many of them stories about his own life or episodes in his own life. Um, you know, um, he's, he's, he's thinking about his cat and from that we we learn we start to think about what's distinctive about human beings as opposed to other animals and and what about our relations with other animals and so on these are all important ethical uh questions so so i think that's how i think about it i think that uh, uh, uh philosophy is is a capacious field there are lots of ways of doing it i'm not saying this is the only way to do it but i think because i was raised by maybe because i was raised by a novelist my my mother was a novelist uh, I, I, it's the natural way for me to do these things, but the, but the, I'll just say that I don't think of the, 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 the stories I tell from my own life are not really, I would say, autobiography because you don't, you can read everything I've written, uh, and you won't really get much of a sense of my life <laughs> because you only get the bits of my life that that are relevant to my philosophy, um, to, to the point, philosophical points I'm making. In autobiography, you're trying to tell the story of a life, and uh, and you and that that has to have a narrative shape too. And I haven't really tried to do that. 